Welcome back to For All Kerbal Kind. Last episode, a whole bunch of stuff went down. We had the Cuban Missile Crisis. We landed on Venus. There's some Venus probes from the Soviet Union being sent, as well as a bunch of other satellites and other things. Oh yeah, we flew past the moon with Gemini. A whole bunch of crazy stuff. In this episode, we're gonna just keep trucking along. But before we get into it, a small message from Styx Networks. Now, KSP2 is theoretically right around the corner, but if you are still itching for that Kerbal Space Program multiplayer fix, Styx Networks has uh, all your Luna multiplayer mod hosting needs. And there's a referral link down below if you'd like to check it out. They also have other games as well. Our Discord actually has a server through them. And we've been hosting events here and there. I think the next one is going to be dropping the science gain to like 5% and seeing how long it takes our community to actually unlock the tech tree. So check out Sticks if you're interested, hop in the Discord, say hi if you're interested. But enough chat, let's hop right into 1963. First things first, some contract changes. We are unable to actually meet the contract requirements for this within the allotted deadline. Uh, simply because other missions are taking precedence over them. So we'll have to cancel this contract for now, and we may pick it up later. <laughs> he did not seem too happy about that, but we are going to accept a lunar landing uncrewed contract, simply because it will coincide with either lunar rover uncrewed and lunar landing and sample return uncrewed, both of which I don't yet have a vehicle made for and don't know if we're currently uh, capable of accomplishing even. But We'll see what we can do. Another thing real quick, with the Gemini program in full swing and the dinosaur program right around the corner, we're gonna wanna hire two more Kerbals. And for these two, I have decided on Alan Kerman as a pilot and Buzz Kerman as a engineer. December 30th, 1962, a new program is underway in Brownsville, Texas. With the ambitious goal of sending a glider into orbit of the Earth, capable of then returning safely through the atmosphere and landing at a runway. Various and numerous tasks could be performed by the program should the initial tests be successful. This program is, of course, called Dinosaur. Today, amidst the end of the year holiday season, Neil Kerman will perform the first live flight test of the KX-20, dropping from a B-52 at 10 kilometers altitude, 50 kilometers from its intended runway landing. The vehicle would be operational with a single crew. It could perform any number of missions, including satellite retrieval, uh, deployment, inspection, if you catch my drift there, uh, espionage, military, honestly, preliminary space tourism, uh, rescue, all sorts of tasks this thing could provide for us if we're able to actually use it correctly. At this point in flight tests, I've been doing a lot of simulations suborbitally just to make sure I know how to fly the thing. And I'm a little rusty, but for the most part, I have a, uh, a good handle on it, I'd say. The ride down is smooth, and Neil expertly glides the first dinosaur back to the ground, safely landing on three skids underneath the glider. February 9th, 1963. After final approach and landing tests are satisfactory, KX-2002, the second dinosaur off the production line, is ready for a more ambitious flight test. Although the possibility of launching to low Earth orbit atop a Catern-1 or the next generation of Chiton is on the table, astral engineers aren't 100% certain how the vehicle will handle during re-entry conditions in the first place. And so, to both test the ascent and re-entry conditions that Dinosaur will face on regular missions, one is fitted atop a Chiton 2, with a noticeable modification to its first stage, that being the addition of aircraft wings bolted to the side of its tank. These theoretically ensure aerodynamic stability during ascent, acting as a counter to Dyna's aerodynamic forces at the top of the rocket. Peter Kerman expressed wishes to pilot this test, but his current medical status has left him grounded for the time being. Instead, new test pilots have been hired for the program, and Alan Kerman is the one to take the spot of suborbital test pilot. Alan reports immediate instability and high turbulence, though the Chiton 2 remains on course. The first stage will perform a roll and pitch program before second stage ignition, aiming to drop the first stage into the Gulf of Mexico, shy of the Florida coast. The second stage will then adjust the KX-20's trajectory far northward towards the eastern coast of the United States. Two and a half minutes into flight, however, 
the abort light blares inside of the cockpit. Second stage pressure has built up and failed to ignite the engine. This is not good. Though he is in no immediate danger, the current trajectory places Alan Kerman on a nosedive into the atmosphere in a vehicle not yet tested under these aggressive conditions. Should the flight have gone to plan, atmospheric entry would have been a little bit more gradual. Nevertheless, Alan pulses RCS away from the failed Chitin missile and prepares to pancake into the atmosphere as much as possible. Falling faster and faster, pulling back on the flight stick becomes increasingly more and more difficult to maintain, though telemetry data indicates Alan's grip never falters. G-forces rise and rise, and as Alan's vision begins to darken, the altimeter screaming downwards begins to slow, and then steadies, and then the test pilot loses consciousness. Through an intricate and experimental fly-by-wire system, autopilot ends up holding the pilot's previous pitch angle, but in so doing creates unstable forces that throw Dinah into a roll, and for a frightening few moments, the glider tumbles, falling through the upper atmosphere. Alan comes to in a rapid spin, and through blurred senses, training kicks in. He grabs a control stick and somehow manages to wrestle the aircraft back to stability. Entry was brutal, but the vehicle is once again in control and appears to be in one piece. It would later be determined the angle of attack at that specific speed, altitude, and trajectory was simply too aggressive. But Alan would be commemorated for his actions pulling out of that dive. As for the KX-20, well, it survives the splashdown in the Gulf, and is generally intact. US naval vessels were stationed at various intervals along Allen's trajectory in the case of this very event, so recovery is relatively swift, although some time will have to be taken to thoroughly inspect the vehicle to ensure flight readiness once again, especially in contact with the salt water, something Dinosaur was not intended to do, splashing down, that is, into the ocean, though it is a relief to know it is an option in the case of another emergency like this one, although a runway or at least a field would definitely have been ideal. February 26th, 1963. The Gemini program has demonstrated theoretical tethering to another spacecraft in orbit of the Earth in previous flights, though the technological means to actually do so were still in development during the last mission. But this is no longer the case as docking apparatus is now fitted to the Gemini spacecraft, aiming to lift off tomorrow. All this mission needs, of course, is a spacecraft to dock with, and this will be the task today of Catalyst C, lifting Gemini's docking target, a modified Agena satellite bus, into orbit of the Earth a day ahead of Gemini 4's flight. Atlas has performed nominally, and the Agena is detached to place itself into low Earth orbit all on its own. Now, if you've been watching my series in Reentry and Orbital Simulator at all, you'll know we performed these very missions ourselves in an actual simulated cockpit, like a flight sim, and it's really, really fun to recreate those things back in Kerbal Space Program, actually like flying the missions for real. Uh, very, very cool. A small note concerning this, pretty soon we're going to be having to learn the Apollo capsule, and that's going to go hand in hand with us unlocking the Apollo capsule in For All Kerbal Kind, so these two series are kind of like neck and neck here, which is kind of interesting. That wasn't really intended, but it's been working out that way. But back to the mission at hand. Reaching orbit, the spacecraft now deploys the fairing which protects the docking port during launch. All systems indicate the mission has gone to plan, and the stage is set for Gemini 4's mission come tomorrow. February 27th, 1963. With the Agena docking vehicle in orbit of the Earth, Gemini 4 will be targeting a specific launch window in order to perform rendezvous after orbital insertion. This should be simple as it has been performed before numerous times. The crew for today's flight is Michael Kerman, the pilot of Gemini 2, and Buzz Kerman, a new addition to the Kerbonaut ranks here at the Foundation. Buzz will get his Kerbonaut wings on quite a monumental mission. Right on time, the mission clock reaches zero, 
and Gemini 4 lifts off the pad. Two and a half minutes after liftoff, the first stage experiences pressure buildup and loses all thrust. Luckily, the second stage's tank contains enough internal pressure to allow the second stage engine to ignite regardless, usually hot staging with the thrust of the first stage behind it. Although efficiency loss is likely the case, Gemini 4 is still go for orbit. Now realistically, I think in the case of this situation, uh, the first stage engine cutting out early, even within nominal parameters of still reaching orbit, I'm actually not sure if the second stage of a Titan missile would have been able to light. Uh, that is something I don't know, I'd assume not, and that would have required the Gemini crew to abort, which would have consisted of just simply separating from the spacecraft, or from the launch vehicle I mean, and pulsing forwards and then uh, performing re-entry checklists as is, and they'd splash down in the ocean, uh, not where they intended at all. Uh, but, for our, uh, but for our gameplay, we're able to continue the mission just fine. The second stage burns through all of its fuel, leaving Michael and Buzz just shy of orbit, likely because of the first stage failure. But no matter, they're easily able to correct their trajectory with the onboard maneuvering system, or OMS. As they finalize their orbit, ground teams work to update the crew with maneuver planning to reach their target. The crew also report at this time their horizon scanner cover seems to have prematurely detached, though nothing appears to behave abnormally, so this is regarded as a harmless anomaly. Due to the current location of the docking vehicle in relation to Gemini 4, after a slight prograde burn at Perigee, it will take roughly seven days for the two spacecraft to complete their rendezvous in orbit. In the meantime, the crew will spend their week analyzing different types of space foods, performing experiments with simple organism egg growth and microgravity, as well as determining the usefulness of the addition of porthole windows on the dorsal side of the spacecraft. These upward-facing windows will allow the crew to view more of their surroundings, specifically useful for situations where they are docked to something obscuring their forward field of view, such as Agena or Kentar in the future, perhaps. The seven days slowly trudge onwards, but eventually, after another small trajectory adjustment, Michael and Buzz flip on their radar and command encoder. The Agena docking vehicle is being picked up on radar. They're closing in fast, roughly 60 meters per second to be exact. The most exciting moment of their likely quite boring week in orbit of the Earth is about to unfold as a glint of light reveals Ajana's position in the black. Using aft thrusters to slow their relative speed, flight reports with their current velocity they will fly past Ajana quite closely before coming to a stop, and they express their wishes to the crew that they try not to bump into anything up there. Right on time, sure enough the Ajana flies dangerously close past the left side of their capsule, and they in fact do not bump into anything. From the brief view, nothing appears abnormal, and soon enough, Gemini comes to a stop, roughly half a kilometer above and next to their docking target. Rendezvous is complete. Next up will be station keeping before an attempt to dock. Michael and Buzz inch closer to their target, amazed at the spectacle before them. Even though it's not something necessarily brand new, it's exciting nevertheless. They are instructed to swing around Agena to inspect the satellite before docking. Michael pilots the capsule around their target with ease, before coming to a stop aligned with the docking port and station keeping at a safe distance. Crew are okay, systems are okay, and the Agena is responding to encoder commands. So Gemini 4 is go for docking. Okay, we're standing by. Roger. Gemini 8 Go ahead. Uh, Roger, uh, stand by for a couple minutes here. Computer TMG and C. Is he docked? Go ahead. Send the low limit on GCO. Negative, he's not docked yet. 1750. Okay, Jiminy, uh, we have TM solid. You're looking good on the ground. Go ahead and dock. 
and docked. On March 7th, seven and a half days after liftoff, Gemini 4 has performed the world's first orbital docking of two spacecraft. Mission control goes wild with excitement. The mission is a grand success so far. The objective of Gemini 4's mission is more than the technological feat of docking, however. This mission is in all aspects a dress rehearsal for Gemini 5. The next flight will aim to orbit the moon by first docking with the much larger and fully fueled Kentar stage in orbit of the Earth. Engineers were unsure about the feasibility of controlling a docked transfer vehicle backwards, for instance, and so Michael and Buzz will assume control of the Ajena and use its primary control system to raise their orbit around the Earth, thus emulating Gemini 5's transfer, capture, and return to a mild extent at least. This was, I believe, the mission plan for Gemini 8 in real life. But as we know, when they docked with the Gina, well, an RCS thruster, an Ohms thruster on the Gemini spacecraft decided to go haywire and start spinning the whole thing. And it was, uh, it was a bit of a dangerous situation that they got out of by the skin of their teeth. And truth be told, I thought about actually recreating the, uh, the problem that happened with Gemini 8 in orbit here. Uh, so I rolled a d20, uh, and I said, okay, if I roll a 1 on this die, we have a failure and we start tumbling, and I didn't roll a 1, so everything is fine. <laughs> this is what would have happened, though, maybe, in, in, my, in our alternate history, at least. <laughs> Honestly, I'm nothing but rolling the dice in these series. Makes me kind of want to play Mars Horizon, because that's a game all about RNG, isn't it? And my RNG is usually terrible, so that would be an amazing time. But I'm getting distracted, let's get back to the mission at hand here. With their apogee slightly raised to a thousand kilometers, the crew detach from Ajena and prepare to perform their re-entry checklists in about five hours from now, aiming to splash down off the Florida coast. Meanwhile, Ajena will be given the command to deorbit itself, aiming to burn up in the atmosphere rather than be left as a piece of space debris in orbit. Its batteries will only last for another week or so regardless, and its mission usefulness has come to an end. The crew detach their equipment module and fire a series of retro thrusters to come back home. Now, within the hour, Michael and Buzz will be back on the surface of the Earth, floating in their tin can off the eastern coast of Florida. Their capsule slowly rotates and adjusts their angle of entry all the way through the atmosphere, safely bringing the crew back home. Now, this is what I believe to be an accurate depiction of what an entry uh, with Gemini would be like. Uh, due to the offset center of mass, you have a slight angle on the heat shield, which gives it a little bit of lift. And if you needed to land a little bit short, you would flip upside down to make yourself dig into the atmosphere more. Or if you needed to go a little bit further, you'd simply be right side up and it lifts you up, uh, prolonging your trajectory through the atmosphere a little bit. Or if you're right on the money, you just go into a slight spin, so the lift zeroes out to your same trajectory there. So you just like rotate slowly, and that's what we've been doing here. Now, it's probably not as fast or as accurate as it would be in real life, but it's still fun to just do it. I think the Apollo capsule is going to have the same thing. I'm not actually sure. I'll have to read up on that. After atmospheric entry, the drogue chutes deploy right on time and prematurely detach entirely, dropping the capsule through the atmosphere. Luckily for the crew, explosive bolts are able to release the main chute in the case of emergency just like this one, and said primary chute deploys nominally. No damage to the chute can be seen by the crew or recovery naval vessels below, so everything seems normal. Just a small heart attack to finish out an otherwise successful mission. Michael and Buzz splash down off the coast, and their week-long journey has come to an end. Gemini 4, though its mission seemed relatively small, got us a lot of money. We're up to 3 million now, and it also did something even more important. In the Available Contracts tab, we now have First Space Station, uh, something that requires uh, room for three crew, and we need to keep two crew on the station for 30 days, leave that module up there in orbit, yada yada yada. What interests us most is this advance of 2.7 million funds. Now, I think we have, what, three years to complete this? Uh, yeah, uh, give or take, a little less than three years. That, uh, we should be able to do that, I'm thinking. We'll come up with something. We'll, we'll have to, right? By that time, we should have landed on the moon, I can only hope. 
So we're going to accept this contract. That seems like it's absolutely huge. We have 5.835 million funds. Now we could accept some more contracts, but realistically, we need to spend some money now. Yeah. First of all, we're going to grab the final piece of infrastructure needed to complete the lunar landing contract, and that is upgrading the astronaut complex to level three so that we can actually plant that flag. So we're going to spend a little bit of money here. Uh, not terrible amount, maybe 20. We're going to put 20 more points into our research speed here. Uh, sorry for the clicks in the background, just to speed that up ever so slightly. Every little bit counts. March 26th, 1963. The Soviet Union has developed a new crewed spacecraft, much more capable than the Voskhod it replaces. The advancement of this new program has progressed much faster than any US intelligence could have foreseen. Today, two Soyuz spacecraft orbit the Earth and have just performed rendezvous and the first docking of two crewed spacecraft in orbit. Advanced EVA and transfer between vehicles is rumored to be taking place as well, although the Astro Foundation has something else to focus on than Soviet activity in orbit. Right now, Santa Maria sits atop a Catern 1, ready for its voyage. Today, the Foundation aims to once again propulsively land a small probe on the surface of the moon. This time, the craft will attempt to return a small portion of itself along with some moon dust back to the Earth. This ambitious goal begins with the roar of Catern lifting off of the pad. Reaching the end of the first stage's burn, an outer engine fails and shuts down. Shortly afterwards, two more engines fail, one explosively, building up pressure and shutting down its thrust. This causes slight oscillation and a bit of an attitude problem in the entire vehicle, but structural integrity holds as well as relative stability thanks to the gimbal of the remaining outer engines. Stage separation is somehow still nominal, and all six RL-10 engines of the second stage ignite. Saturn's second stage performs without incident, and the Kentar is released to perform the final push into orbit of the Earth. As the sun sets behind it, night falls back in Brownsville, Texas, and now mission planners will instruct Kentar to perform a translunar injection when the timing is right. This occurs 60 minutes after orbital insertion, when Kentar lights her engines once more. A successful burn later, and Santa Maria is now moonbound. If you're curious about the name of this mission, and the previous lunar lander as well for that matter, the Mayflower and the Santa Maria were two of the naval vessels that brought the first pilgrims to the Americas, eventually leading to the foundation of a new nation, the United States of course. Though this brought about some, well, arguably horrible circumstances, I figure these ship names would still serve as inspirational titles. Robotic pilgrims sent to a new world, the surface of the moon. Speaking of, Santa Maria has arrived, and Kentar will now be captured into lunar orbit, preparing to descend to the surface. With a low elliptical orbit achieved, Kentar will perform two more maneuvers before detaching Santa Maria. The first will establish the intended landing zone, in this case, a large flat area on the surface called Mare Serenitatis. At the current lunar cycle, this location will provide adequate solar exposure and communication coverage to keep the mission powered and controlled for its duration. Kendar approaches 10 kilometers from the lunar surface, falling at just over 100 meters per second. At this point, the transfer stage will aim to eliminate relative surface velocity completely at roughly two kilometers from the surface. This is the second burn mentioned after reaching lunar orbit. 
From there, both Kentar and Santa Maria are now detached from another and fall to the surface, the former being destroyed while the latter softly touches down via its own propulsion. All aspects have been performed well, and the lander simply pulses its engines to maintain a desired vertical velocity all the way down to the surface. This is a necessary dance to ensure mission success without the danger of miscalculating a suicide burn, since throttleable engines are not yet able to be implemented as of yet. The engines used have a null chance of failure, however, so risk is non-existent, and Santa Maria is able to safely land on the lunar surface. Via a small handful of instruments, temperature, telemetry, mass spectrometry, and microatmospheric pressure detection data is collected and transmitted back to the Earth. Some of this data, however, is stored in a small return capsule at the top of the craft. A tube-like structure houses conveyor-like mechanics that will serve to collect absolutely minute amounts of lunar dust uprooted from the propulsive landing. This dust is stored in the capsule as well, aiming to demonstrate the possibility of sample return with no real mechanical science value. Missions in the future will expand on this technology, aiming to collect much larger samples than this, however. Now, spending several hours on the surface, the time comes to shut down surface systems and prepare for ascent to lunar orbit, something that has never before been performed. This ascent is, of course, much easier than reaching orbit of the Earth. Lack of any significant atmosphere means our only contender to deal with is simply gravity, far less than the Earth. The feat is much simpler than landing and is performed with ease. Santa Maria aims for a circular orbit of roughly 30 kilometers or so, safely above the surface in a stable orbit where ground control will begin calculating its return journey. A difficult task will be to locate and retrieve the small capsule looking to be returned to the Earth, so this must be as precise as possible. The Foundation determines an adequate recovery zone in the South Pacific Ocean, and the US Navy will have three days to position vessels accordingly. We will know with pinpoint accuracy when and where Santa Maria will pierce the atmosphere of the Earth, but any number of factors could affect its return trajectory through the atmosphere, and so the recovery zone is quite wide. The lander fires its engines to leave lunar orbit a bit over an hour from lifting off from the surface. Its lunar voyage is in its final phase. Coming up is the most dangerous part, re-entry. The recovery capsule is detached, slowly spin stabilized for its descent. Nothing anyone can do for it now but monitor telemetry data until plasma blackout. From then on, we will solely rely on visual tracking. Telemetry will read out temperatures rapidly begin to increase, and g-forces felt by the craft of sustained 9 g's before all connection is lost. Seven days from the liftoff of Catern 1, a US naval vessel spots the inferno of re-entry. A tiny speck streaks across the sky from horizon to horizon. Reporting this, naval aircraft are deployed to locate the vessel when its parachute deploys. And the suspense is high, as nobody seems to be able to locate it for several minutes. And then, the drogue chute fires within visual range. Santa Maria has done it landing on the surface of the moon and returning to the Earth. A demonstration full of wealth in funding and scientific research, though worth much more in experience and pride. A path is blazed ahead for Kerbals to follow the lead of these first vessels, Mayflower and Santa Maria, and training swiftly begins. Trinity is in development, but still a long ways off. Until then, we have a very small amount of lunar dust to study in the meantime. Mission success. Santa Maria was a great success. We have half a million more funds, and we have some upgrade points, which I'm gonna throw all into our R&D speed, and I'm actually gonna spend a little bit more money, do one more, to increase that even more, because again, this is sort of our bottleneck for our tech. So our tech speed is increasing rapidly, getting us all the way out to uh, being able to land on the moon sometime soon. 
Uh, we were able to collect 60 science just from recovering a vessel from the moon for the first time, so that was a huge gain. Apart from the something like 40, 50 some science that we got from the mission, I don't remember exactly. But we have 219 science to spend, so you bet your butts we're grabbing lunar landing and probably large hydrolox engine as well. Although we do have a decision, we could go for station prototypes. Uh, but I think that we'll be able to get to that later, and we should probably just go for large hydrolox engines instead. April 14th, 1963. We return to Wallops, Virginia in the early hours of the morning for the launch of OSCS-3. Pathfinder D, with its array of scout boosters, counts down to its second attempt at placing a test satellite into orbit. The OSCS-2 mission had failed due to problems with avionics. This has since been rectified. OSCS-3, on the other hand, experiences a different problem. Pathfinder experiences structural instability and lack of control approaching maximum dynamic pressure during the ascent. The added thrust of the scout boosters compromises aerodynamic stability during the initial phases of ascent when commands to begin the pitch maneuver ascent, and the vehicle is engulfed by a brilliant ball of flame as scout boosters detach and wildly soar in every direction away from the explosion. It is about to rain fire and debris on the east coast, and there is nothing the range safety officer can do about it at this point in time. Luckily, no one was injured. However, Pathfinder will never again fly with as many boosters. It is clearly unsafe to do so despite the numbers adding up. The OSCS-4 mission will continue with changed plans to utilize the Catless launch vehicle instead, aiming for a launch window towards the end of the year. June 2nd, 1963. Catern once again waits for its time to launch from Brownsville. Its payload, another lunar surface exploration endeavor, just as ambitious as the last. Wanderer 1 will aim to become the first spacecraft to ever traverse the lunar surface, the first unmanned rover to operate in space. More about its various objectives later. For now, Catern 1 roars to life. Without incident, Catern 1 Kentar has reached roughly a 500 km high orbit of the Earth, and will undergo the same maneuvers Mayflower and Santa Maria have performed before it, performing a translunar injection merely 30 minutes from liftoff. Aiming for an initial paraloon of also 500 km from the lunar surface, Kentar will more than just capture into orbit of the Moon. In a single burn, Wander will be placed on an almost impact trajectory via an aggressive change to its initial inclination and velocity approaching the moon. Essentially, rather than simply slowing down into orbit, Kentar will power slide directly into a targeted pre-landing trajectory, allowing the small rover to be placed on the leading edge of the moon, just south of the equator. This drift is necessary to achieve mission goals, since the initial transfer burn did not account for mission specifics, unfortunately. The stage should still hold enough fuel to perform this burn, as well as the final braking burn over an hour later, should everything go to plan. As the Earth rises in the distance, Wanderer 1 approaches the surface of the moon, waiting for its ride to slow its trajectory at a precise time before it will detach and take over the final landing procedures with its landing platform. Soaring above the surface at merely 3 kilometers altitude, Kentar lights its engines to come to a stop. Both Catern and Kentar have performed without fail, and now the Wanderer 1 vehicle is released, control is activated, and thrusters fire. It's always a nail-biter back at mission control, watching altitude and telemetry data stream back, hoping for success. But just like Santa Maria, Wanderer 1 is able to pulse its engines as it slowly approaches the lunar surface. Nothing appears abnormal, though attitude control is a bit lackluster, it is able to perform this with relative ease. And on June 7th, it doesn't take long for the rejoicing roar of joy to erupt in the otherwise painfully quiet room back in Texas. Wanderer 1 is safely on the surface of the moon, and its exploration mission can now begin. 
Wanderer detethers from its landing platform and leans forward slightly to observe the immediate surroundings. Confident in its ability to roam, the rover applies slight torque to its wheels, stepping foot, if it were, onto its new home. I heard her whisper my name Calling out past Jupiter The sound of her voice rang through radio waves Telling me to find her there in Saturn's rings Then I'll wander off I'll wander off Then I'll wander off I'll wander off I heard her whisper Ocean waves of asteroids in empty space Till suddenly the signal strength fades My vessel all but dies and then I see her face Then I'll wander off I'll wander off Then I'll wander off I'll wander off. She's ever been I think I lost my way Everywhere I've been Starts to look the same I'm dreaming or die Maybe when I wake Then I'll wander off I'll wander off Then I'll wander off I'll wander off Traveling to the nearest lunar mountain peak to observe the surrounding area, Wanderer's mission has truly begun. Expected to hibernate during the Kummer lunar nights, travel and observe during the lunar days, it is unsure just how long the rover's batteries will last. Its primary contract, investigating three specific points on the lunar surface, has now begun. Whether it will succeed or not, we'll just have to wait until the next episode. That's right, we're going to start off the next episode with driving this rover around some more. Uh, the contract that we have accepted requires us to visit three points. We're going to be using the Bon Voyage mod that will allow me to drive this in the background so I don't have to hold W for hours and hours at a time to get there, even though I very well could. Now, some final notes for the episode. We do have news of a rather large Soviet mission taking place in orbit of the Earth uh, starting around this time and going through July. A multi-launch assembly is rumored to be taking place with a crewed vessel possibly aiming for the moon. And we know nothing more than that. We'll just have to see what pans out in the coming months. I'm ending this episode in early June, and Beardy's video goes on through the end of July. So a little bit of a time difference there. But let me know what you guys thought of the episode. So Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and peace out. Peace out.